Yeah, so this is the the final lecture for the unit. I don't have too much to say today. Uh, we're going to be meeting briefly on Monday as well. So uh, I'll, I'll leave any final thoughts for, for that day. But uh, just a reminder that um, by the end of day on Monday, have all four assignments turned in, demoed, and uh, scored with a one out of one. And you will be all set for unit three or liftoff. And uh, I will be dividing people into groups um, beginning on the morning of the 14th. So just make sure that you have those, uh, those items checked off before then. And um, you'll be all set for liftoff. If you have any questions, you can always shoot me a DM for then, but have a great uh, last day of lecture, everybody. And I will be uh, meeting with the TAs now. I'll, I'll go ahead and open up that room right after this. Thanks, Colin. All right, let me get this back up. There we go. So tonight, our final uh, lecture, unit two, is chapter 20, Web APIs and REST. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and you will have a studio tonight uh, where you get to practice some of these things. Um, and yeah, what Colin said, basically, about, about uh, the deadline for all the graded assignments. OK. So let's talk about web, web APIs and REST. So this is the idea of having stateless uh, systems. Um, so we'll talk about those concepts. What is REST? What is statelessness? Um, and then have a little bit of a refresher on, uh, you know, things like, um, you know, paths and hosts and URLs. And we'll talk about resources and URIs, talk about um, some of the HTTP methods and um, the different codes that you can have for response codes. Um, and then we're going to actually talk about how you would create a RESTful API in Spring Boot, because I have some syntax I can share with you that may be helpful, oh, say, in your uh, capstone projects for Unit 3. Just maybe. OK, so uh, let's start at the top. REST and statelessness. So this is uh, REST stands for represent Representational State Transfer. And uh, essentially, it just means you can have two systems, they operate independently, and uh, we call those RESTful because they don't need to know uh, exactly what the state of the other one is at any time. So if you have an API on a back end, it essentially um, exists so that another system can reach out and ask for, um, you know, make a request and ask for data um, whenever it wants to. And whatever data is received from that other system is pretty much just the state of that system at that moment. It's just a snapshot. And that's why, you know, they're not constantly keeping tabs on each other. They only know, um, you know, when they re when it reaches out. So um, I have a diagram here that, uh, you know, kind of shows you what a back end and a front end, um, the kind of the separation of the two. And, this says Angular app, and it says that for a good reason, because we used to teach Angular instead of React. And the uh, example I'm going to show you later tonight actually is still an Angular application, but the uh, salient points would be the same for React. So don't worry about that part. But the idea here is that you would have some sort of front end application that, um, you know, handles just the, the parts that, you know, mostly the parts that the user is interacting with. And then it can reach out to some API on some backend application somewhere, right? Uh, and maybe that's a Spring Boot app and it's connected to a database and you add um, a special kind of uh, controller, a REST controller that can serve as an API so that you can access that information um, from outside this application and make it available to other, to other applications and other sources. Um, so that's the idea there. Two different, two completely different systems, but they can communicate. Um, and so resources, URIs, and URLs. Uh, resources just means retrievable data. So 
If you can request it and retrieve it from another source, that's a resource. Um, its format is completely independent of the systems. So you'll often see things like JSON or XML or HTML that are transferred. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, those two systems can't necessarily talk to each other if they're coded in different languages and different frameworks, right? But if we have something like JSON, um, it can be independent and you know, it, all the data can be converted into JSON, sent uh, as the response to the request, and then the other application can take it from there and convert it into whatever it needs to. So a URI stands for Unique Resource Identifier, and a URL is just one of several types of URIs. And uh, when you have a RESTful API, the path that you have uh, for that URL is called the identifier for the resource. Um, and this is kind of how, how it breaks down. And you've seen some of this before, but we'll talk about it. So the anatomy of a URL, uh, you have a scheme, right? Um, and you have like, you know, possibly some sort of user and password, but you've got a host, you may have a port, um, a path, a query, uh, maybe perhaps even a fragment um, so that you can, you know, anchor to some specific spot on the page or something. Um, all of those things make up that scheme um, that makes up the URL. And the part that is uh, most important for talking about tonight, give me just a second, I need to fix something here. There we go, is the path because that is your REST resource. Um, and uh, we, you know, we call that an endpoint. Um, you're gonna hear that again. We're gonna talk about it in a little bit. Um, so if we review a little bit more about what we know about HTTP, uh, you have clients and servers, right? So the client is something like a browser that uh, is where you are actually doing the requests and receiving whatever resource comes back from the server, which is what provides the resource. And uh, the client may send a request, um, the server sends the response, and those requests, requests and responses can have headers and they can have a body also known as a payload. Um, so those are just some helpful terms to know because you'll hear different people refer to them with, with some of these terms. Uh, so there again, um, you know, there's the internet, you have all these different clients uh, reaching out and there's some sort of server and you've got requests and responses going back and forth. So some of those uh, common methods that we uh, have talked about many times are get, of course, which is the R in CRUD or read, uh, post um, for creating new data, which is the C or create in CRUD, put is for updating existing information, that's the U or update, and then delete, of course, is the D uh, for removing data from the server. Um, so we are going to focus on those four methods, uh, generally speaking. Um, those are the ones you're going to be using most of the time. And then, of course, the response codes. Um, we, we, we talked about this in unit one, but I'll, it's been a while, so we'll talk about it again. Typically, uh, if you've got a response code that starts with a one, like you know 100 something, um, that's informational. Um, it might just be something that comes back to you at the very beginning before the uh, request is fully processed and the full response is received. Uh, 2XX, uh, anything 200 is usually uh, something successful um, that uh, the server was able to you know, provide some sort of successful response. 300 is for redirection. Um, 400 is a client error. So there's something wrong with the request on the front. Um, but if you have a 500, it's something that was wrong on the server side, on the back end. Um, and you can have lots of different codes that are very, very specific but those are the broad categories. So um, it's helpful to kind of know those general categories because if you get into this in a job and you're working with these kinds of things, making requests, you're gonna start learning a lot more specific ones and having those categories in your head will help. Um, so does anybody have any questions before I start talking about specifics with Spring Boot? Okay, so let's talk about creating a RESTful API in Spring Boot. What if you want your Spring Boot application to make your data available to someone else on the outside or some other application that you have you know, created in a completely different framework like React or Angular? 
um, you would have to make a number of changes and I'm going to kind of go over them uh, one by one. First of all, you would want to create a new controller um, uh, called uh, a REST controller. And so you're going to use a different annota annotation. You're going to use REST controller instead of controller. Um, it essentially just combines controller and response body into one. And uh, because it, it makes sure that uh, it knows that it's going to be, you're going to be actually like sending some sort of data straight and you're not referring to a template or anything. You're just sending the data. So you remember from the very beginning when we learned about Spring Boot, we were using response body uh, because we were not yet using templates. And we wanted to make sure that it knew we like we're sending you literal text or literal HTML or something that we want you to put on the page. So the same thing would be used for sending JSON. Um, you want to uh, auto wire any rep repositories that you need to tap into the database, just like you would in another controller. Um, and uh, the data will automatically be serialized for transmission. So that's just a term that means it's uh, you know, put into the format that it needs to be put into so that the other system will be able to make sense of it, like JSON. Um, so there's something we need to talk about that uh, you ask, you know, anybody who works with the stuff and they'll say, ooh, cores, ah, you know, because it's uh, can be a pain in the butt, but you need to know about it because it will be a pain in the butt. Um, cores is cross-origin resource sharing. Um, and it has a very important purpose. It's makes sure that you can define very specifically for security reasons, who and what can communicate with your application. So um, most of the time browsers are gonna be preventing uh, other systems from communication. And you might sometimes try to reach out uh, to get some sort of like information and it'll say that there's a, you know, a cores issue that there's, you know, it's protected because it's um, the, the, of the cross origin resource sharing. So the way that you can do this, you can specify it so that it'll always work the way you intend for it to is to put uh, a, a cross origin um, annotation on your controller class on this rest controller. And then um, there's a parameter for that origins, and you can set that to be a very specific URL if you want to. So you can say it needs to always originate from this, and, and this is what we allow, and we're not going to allow any, you know, anyone else to access this data. Um, so that can be done. And then there's also a parameter max age, and it defaults to 1800 milliseconds, also known as 1.8 seconds. Uh, but you can set it to something different if you want to give it a little bit more or a little bit less time to respond. Uh, so that's um, that's kind of uh, what you have to do just to set up the controller in the first place. So um, I'm going to show you what I've done to our art gallery app. Uh, this is the wrong one. Let me go over here. Okay. So you can see over here with the controllers, I've got all the same controllers I've been using, right? Uh, artist, artwork, authentication, gallery, style. But I've added a, an API folder and inside that I've got an API artwork controller. Um, and I'm keeping my API stuff separate from the other controllers on purpose because they, they serve two completely different uh, functions. This is for my uh, you know, web app that's built into this Java, the Spring Boot app that's gonna use the you know, timely templates and stuff, right? Whereas this controller has nothing to do with that. This one is purely to serve as this portal, this gateway to allow outside um, you know, clients to reach in and request data. So uh, I've got the cross origin um, annotation here. I've set my origins to be localhost 4200. And that's because that's the server that Angular runs on uh, locally for my computer. So I'm saying I'm I'm allowing my local machine to reach out um, from this from this uh, particular location, and I just set the max age to be you know 3600. I gave it twice as long. Um, then uh, I've got the REST controller instead of controller, um, so that it uh, has all of these things that it's combining together, including response body, which we need. And then um, I've set the request mapping to be a very specific uh, route. Uh, I want, you know, localhost 8080 slash API slash artworks. And then I'm going to auto wire the artwork repos repository and make that uh, information available from the database. That's the purpose of this is just for the artworks 
um, that I want to make available as an API. So that's the first uh, step is just to set that up for this uh, controller to be uh, to serve as your API controller. Um, so then uh, you would need to write your your handler methods, you know, so that you can handle each of the endpoints as someone makes a request. So to do that, um, you could return a class type, but um, this uh, response entity with um, the little, you know, uh, arrow brackets here um, will allow you to bundle together uh, the information along with a status code. Remember, we talked about those three digit codes, right? Um, so instead of returning like um, a list of artworks or whatever, I'm just going to return this response entity that's going to allow me to put together, you know, uh, any artworks that I have that are, you know, coming from my request to the, to the database and um, an HTTP status. And if you haven't found it, you can use uh, you know dot not found instead of okay um, for uh, you know making sure that it, the right code is sent. So some of this stuff is built in to these um, these interfaces and classes that we use, like like HTTP status, which is pretty cool. Um, makes it easy to uh, just set this up immediately and do what you want without having to hard code a bunch of other stuff. So all I have really, you know, done here for this is um, to say, I've got this, uh, I want to go get a, a list of artworks um, and, you know, go to the artwork repository, find them all, and then return them. And I'm going to return them, um, the list, as a response entity and also return HTTP status OK. Um, and for this one, I set it up pretty simply. It's actually simpler than it is on the slide just because I know that there's always going to be at least one artwork in my database um, the way I have it set up. So it's not a problem. Um, but uh, this one right here, oh, the reason that that looks different. Okay, sorry, let me go back. The reason this looks different is I, I'm looking at the wrong one. This is the one for uh, slash ID. If we wanted to go to an artwork details page, um, we would be able to do it by ID. So uh, we're saying if you want to look up the information just on a single artwork, you can do that. We'll have this path variable. So that's this one right here. And this is where you need to use an optional because that ID number may not be valid, right? There might not be something in the database with that ID number. And if so, we need to actually send back a container and check and see if that's present or not. And if it is, we can re return you know, HTTP status, okay. If it's not, we'll return not found. Um, so uh, this, you know, lets you finesse that so that you can send the right one, depending on whether that ID exists in the database or not. All right, so um, your handler methods um, are one thing, but you also have, sometimes you have complex data and in order for it to convert it into JSON properly, you might have to put some additional annotations in your uh, models. Um, so for example, um, if you have one-to-many or many-to-many -many relationships, there's a little bit of complexity there, right? You have like lists of objects that are you know, being stored as part of it, like a single artwork. Um, so there are some annotations that we can use to do this. The first one is uh, JSON managed reference. Um, that's the one that if you're sending the object of that class, so in this case, artworks, then you want to use this to refer to anything that also is an object. Um, like, uh, you know, we have uh, an artist that has its own properties and um, we have, you know, a list of uh, a list of artworks on the other side. So then on the other side, we'd use JSON back reference to basically say, you know, I want to handle it from this side and from that side. This should always be connected to this. And, and we already have that connection with the mapped by, right? So uh, let me show you an example of this. So um, we have artists right here um, and it refers to one of these, right? That has a first name, a last name, a location. So in the artist, model, I put JSON back reference to say, this is the thing I'm talking about that's going to, you know, have, you know, this, this relationship, this mini relationship. And then over an artwork where we actually are 
referencing that object, we say JSON managed reference. And by putting both of those on there, it prevents there being an infinite loop where it's trying to reach out to database and make sense of the relationship and it's not making sense of it. So keep that in mind that if you decide to, you know, depending on how you do your data for um, your uh, capstone project, you may need um, something like this uh, if you have an object within an object um, that's coming from two different tables in your database. And so I've done the same thing with styles, right? I've got, this is a many to many relationship. So I have the JSON managed reference in artwork. And then over in style, I've got JSON back reference here um, for to, to refer back to that list of artworks. And so it now knows to stop, you know, looping and looping and looping forever, trying to figure it out. It's going to say, okay, gotcha, no problem, and then move on. Um, okay, so that'll take care of that. Um, if you have fields or method, methods in the Java class that you want to not be included for some reason, you can add uh, JSON ignore to them. And I'm trying to remember if I do actually have any of those. Um, I don't think I do, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't think I do. But it's good to know because every once in a while there might be something where it's like, I need this for this part of my application, but I don't actually want it to be included with any JSON that's sent off uh, through an API. Melanie, you got a question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, does basically the mapped by tell it like which, so like you have multiple of the annotations, like is that what tells it which one it's referring back to? Yeah, so when you use many to one and one to many like this, mm -hmm. um, many to one is saying, okay, I've got um, you know many artworks that could be associated with one artist. Right. Um, on, the, on the artist side, because this is in the artist, you have one to many and you say, you know, the field, the name of the field on the other side of this is artist. So you're pointing back to that right there. Right. But I'm talking about like the JSON managed reference. Oh, part. Um, beca because it already ha knows about the relationship in this sense. Okay. All that's, to, yeah. Yeah. All you have to do is just have, you know, managed reference and then back reference and you just make sure you got the right one on, on the right one. <laughs> okay. And, and it handles it from there. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, Sneha? So yeah, my question was about the cross origin annotation. So mm -hmm. in that we uh, put the local host and the port number, right? So can we like put that in configuration file, like application setting and get it from there? Because I think companies don't like things like that exposed or something like that. Uh, yeah, you know, um, ordinarily, yes, you would have that in an environmental variable or, or you'd have, yeah, you'd have that like protected somewhere because um, the only reason that I have it this way is just to be very obvious for you guys that I'm running this locally. It's the only place I'm running it. And so I just, I just want you to see, you know, an actual value but, for that. But yeah, in practice, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hard code it like but this. Do, how do we do that? Like, how, I mean, do, how, do you have to ask, create a variable here in the code? Uh, I mean, I just don't know how to do that. So I'm asking. Uh, there can be, um, you can have um, other files that you would import from that would store uh, information like that. Um, and then you also could use, uh, you know, if you're sharing this with people, you could also use environmental variables for that, just like you do for your da your database stuff. It just oh. depends. It can be set up different ways. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So there's one last thing here uh, that you wanna be mindful about, and that's the authentication piece because uh, we actually implemented that in our last class for this application. If you have um, some sort of basic authentication in place, you want to whitelist that API path, right? <laughs> so that if people can actually access it. Um, and that way, uh, any API calls that are made will actually be processed instead of being bypassed. Um, so uh, over in my authentication filter, um, I just went into my whitelist right here and I just added API as the, you know, the, the root path um, and basically means anything that anybody does, if it starts with API, it's allowed. And it's going to um, then, when those calls are made, it's going to use, uh, you know, these, um, these handlers here, it'll, you know, 
uh, access this and run run this code and, and provide the response the way we expect it to. Um, if you're using Spring Security, everything's going to be different. And so that is just an, a challenge for another day. Like I said before, um, if you want to tackle uh, using Spring Security for your capstone project, you are welcome to. Um, it, it, students before have done it, um, but it is going to uh, be a whole other thing. Um, so I'm just showing you how to do it with the basic authentication that you've already learned. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions um, about anything I've talked about so far? Ooh. Okay. Um, so it's a little early um, and, and lecture may or may, may go um, pretty quick after this, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and give us a five minute break um, now. And then when we come back, I'm going to demonstrate what it looks like to actually access the data from the other side, from the front. Okay. Um, now that you kind of know how you can set it up on the back, we need to do the other side. So we'll do that in five minutes. I will see you then.
Okay. Um, I am going to demo uh, the uh, Angular app on the front end and Spring Boot API on the back end thing. But first, um, they have introduced a studio for this chapter now. And so I want to show you a little bit about how to use Postman because you're going to install and use Postman tonight if you don't already have it installed. This is a great tool and uh, it allows you to reach out to uh, any API anywhere and make requests. Um, and I'm just gonna show you how to do a couple of Git requests, which are of course the simplest kind, cause you're just saying, hey, get me some information as opposed to making like a post request where you're you know, saving data to a database or you know, deleting or whatever. Um, and you're gonna get to practice uh, several things tonight, but uh, I've got this um, quotable API. So public APIs usually have documentation. It can look a lot of different ways. Some things have better documentation than others. I talked about this a little bit when we, we first introduced the, uh, JSON to you in uh, unit one. Um, but this one, Quotable, uh, it has uh, just um, a, a, a readme on its GitHub here, and it tells you all about it. So it tells you that the server is running at api.quotable.io, and then it talks about all the different ways that you can um, you know, use it. So you can, uh, make a get request at slash random, which will uh, get you a random quote. There are, um, uh, and it also says this method is deprecated in favor of get random quotes. So uh, he's even, you know, telling you I've updated this and do do this other thing instead, you know. Um, but the, you know they have different query parameters so that you can make a spec. Excuse me, so that you can specify what you're looking for. He tells you how the response is probably going to be structured depending on you know what you did. Um, and then um, this is the new one, the, the new and improved, uh, slash quote slash random. And uh, instead of um, returning a single quote, it can return more than one. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you how you can use something like Postman to make requests to APIs like this. Um, and I am going to update this because um, I actually am still using the old one. <laughs> and I just noticed, hey, it's been deprecated. So I'm gonna use slash quotes. So I've got, uh, I'm making a Git request. You can choose what kind of request you're making here um, and then put in you know, the, the entire um, you know, endpoint path, um, the, the URL here. So I'm gonna go you know, to api.quotable.io slash quote slash random. And then I'm going to add on uh, tags and I'm gonna say um, history. So let's send this and see what we get. Okay, so I get an array that has exactly one response because it's still just a, um, a single random one. Um, and what if I change uh, the value of history to, uh, I don't know, um, how about uh, war? We get a quote by Albert Einstein. I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Um, we could have quotes about life. And um, this is the final test of a gentleman is respect for those who can be of no possible value to him by William Lyon um, Phelps. Um, okay, so it gives us this information. We get this data back. It's nicely formatted in JSON. You can look at it different ways. Uh, pretty is nice with J JSON because it makes it very easy easy to read and it has all the indents and stuff. Um, you can even, if you know, if it's not something, uh, if it's not JSON, it's something else, you can change, you know, the way that it comes out here um, as well. Uh, so what if we wanted to add another tag? I mean, they tell us here that there are other parameters, right? Like author. So what if I uh, decided, okay, I'm not gonna use a tag, but I do wanna use author. So let's do uh, author and I'm gonna say Albert Einstein and see if we get something different back. Yeah, so we get a different Albert Einstein quote, uh, feeling and longing are the motive forces behind all human endeavor and human creations. And those tags happen to be famous quotes and life. Um, and so you could, you know, uh, use all these different uh, parameters and you notice that as I type things down here, it's updating it here um, for the entire URL, right? Um, and so I could even add, you know, this back in to add life and hit send again. And now we're getting a different quote by Albert Einstein about life because <laughs> um, I actually decided to use both of those. 
Uh, so this is this is how this works. So let's say we wanted to do this for our uh, backend application, right? So I can go over to uh, IntelliJ here and I need to get this up and running. It will not do us any good if it's not up and running. So I'm gonna let this uh, get started. There it is, Tomcat started on port 8080. Okay, so I can come over here, here, and um, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna hit this uh, plus sign to create a new tab so I can do a new request. I do want get, so I'll leave that as it is. And I'm just gonna put HTTP uh, colon slash slash localhost 8080 uh, slash API slash artworks, because that's the um, endpoint that I set up, right? Um, and, uh, I'm just going to do just that and send the request and look at that. I get an array of every single artwork in my database because that's what I set it up to do. Right. Um, so we can see all of them here and each one has, um, a lot of information. Um, it's got the ID, the title, the artist, and then inside that, this is where that JSON managed reference comes in handy. Because it saw, you know, we were able to say, okay, artist is not a primitive, it's another object. And so it was able to, you know, figure out how to structure this. And then styles, um, you know, it's a list and it's going to have multiple objects in it. So it figured that out and knows how to do that. Uh, and then, of course, there's details, which is also an object, but uh, it's a one to one relationship. So you don't have to use that JSON managed reference on one to one, only if, it's, if there's a many in the relationship. Um, because otherwise you have the loops. So all of it comes together into one nice big JSON object with all of the information about that artwork coming from the different tables in the database because of all of those relationships, it's able to put all this together, which is really nice. Um, so we can also test out the other endpoint we set up, which was uh, to find a very specific artwork by ID. So what if I put in slash 32? Um, then I get, you know, a very specific one, theatrical release poster series, Hair by Andrew Fisher, and um, it has all the information in here about it. Okay, so we have proven that uh, we can go somewhere completely unconnected to our Spring Boot application, and we can make a request uh, while it's up and running, locally, of course, because it is um, running on localhost. But it would work the same way if it was being served where you could access it um, out on the web. Um, so, uh, now that we've done that, let's go see what it looks like to actually, uh, use it from within another application. Does anybody have any questions about this part before I move on to, uh, doing the, showing you how it works on the Angular side? You guys good? You're going to get a lot, you're get a chance to play with this a lot. And I recommend that you uh, go find other public APIs like Quotable and play around, figure out, you know, do I have to add any headers? Like, do I need to go in here and add any additional headers or anything like that? They're gonna tell you what the requirements are um, for their API. And then you can test it in here before you go and try to test it in some application you're writing. Um, okay, so let's uh, come over to um, VS Code. So this is an Angular application that I put together that's basically, because you remember how we said that our, our Spring Boot application, our Java web app essentially is like an administrative portal, right? This is where someone can go and they just log in just to manage the data. Well, what if you still wanted to have a front facing site for, but using that same data from that same database, right? That's where the API comes in handy. So what this Angular application is, is a website um, for the general public. And uh, it's gonna look a little bit different than our admin went did. I mean, it's got a lot of the same design, but it's going to uh, you know, present the information differently. And I've kept it pretty simple. It really just presents the artworks in a nice format and then allows you to see details about them. That's, that's about all it does right now. Um, you do not need to worry about the fact that you don't know Angular. What's important is that um, we're fetching the data using some JavaScript uh, here that um, is the same way that you would do it if you were doing it with React, okay? 
Uh, and I've created an asynchronous um, method here called fetch artworks that goes and uh, you know awaits the response. And then once it has the response, um, it uh, you know waits for it to be unpackaged properly. And I have this set up. I have a class set up uh, that that you know enables me to actually structure it the way that I want the data to. And then I go through um, the payload, which is you know an array of all these different artworks. And I go through each one and I set the data exactly how I want to um, using my classes and and all of this. And I get everything you know all put in there so that it kind of mirrors what you would see here. Um, but it's a it's a JavaScript um, object, and um, instead of JSON. So uh, I get all that done, and then I sort the list, and then I change my is loading boolean to false. Um, and you remember when I was teaching you guys uh, about React, um, you learned the use use state hook, and that would be where like maybe your list of artworks in React would be stored in state, right, with a state variable. Um, and I also taught you about use effect. Use effect is kind of the React equivalent of this ng on init. Um, one of the ways you can use the use effect hook is to set something to run as soon as the component starts to load. This is what this is doing. And so it calls it and then makes sure that the, the data comes in before we say the page is loaded. And then over in the template um, with the HTML, we say, you know, we're only gonna load this information once the data is there, because we, we're going to wait for this to be true. So you would do this the similar thing, uh, like I showed you with React. Um, this is just, you're just seeing how it's done in Angular, but it's it's the same concept, even if the syntax is a little bit different. So that's, uh, that's all you really need to know is that, you know, this would be um, one way that you could just go, you know, get the data that you want for this page, make sure it's here. And then, um, we can actually get this up and running. So um, I'm going to say ng serve to get uh, this Angular app up and running. It's thinking about it. OK, so React applications, um, the ones that we were creating, were running on port 3000, right? Angular runs on 4200. So what we're going to do uh, when this is done is we're going to go to localhost 4200, and then we'll see uh, the, this application running in the browser. OK, uh, and you can see it right here. I'm going to command click on this uh, to take us there. And look at this. Um, it's going to take a second for all the images to load because I did not create like smaller versions of them just for this. Um, they're the original sizes. But uh, I've got this in um, what's called a masonry layout. It's kind of like what you see on Pinterest. They, they kind of pioneered it, I think. Um, but yeah, so I've got some CSS going on behind the scenes. It's making this look, you know, look the way that it does. But you can see I've got all these little tiles um, that show off, you know, each piece of art. Um, and then I can click into any one of them. And it uh, takes me to this details page. And that's where you see the slash artwork slash 20. And I have my um, I have my Angular application set up to you know kind of mimic the same the same path that you would have if you were doing it um, straight with like Postman or something. It's similar. So um, this is uh, you know just got you know a larger image and all the information and stuff. And you can go back. And the way this is running right now, the images have to load every single time. But that's just because I did not uh, put a lot of extra work into uh, preventing that. But that's okay. Um, so this is you know a completely different application on a completely different framework, running on a completely different port. But um, we can still go to localhost 8080, and we can still access our other application and see its um, you know, interface because the admin portal is actually being run uh, directly from the Spring app, right? Um, it's got all those controllers that are controlling all these routes, uh, the way that we set it up and we can you know, log in. <laughs> I'm trying to, what was, uh, what's my password? Yeah, there we go. Okay, and we can still we can still use this application as well on a different port at port 8080. Um, they're two different, two di completely different websites, but one of them is being served um, directly by the Java application. The other one is being served as an Angular application, and it's using the API endpoint to get to the data from the data base. 
So that's the difference. Who has questions? Yeah, Sam? So do we always have to build two applications like that? No. Uh, the advantage to using something like um, Angular and React is that um, they're a lot more interactive because you're not having to make calls to a server for every little change. So you can have a lot of really cool, fast moving, you know, uh, interactive stuff on the page and you can, um, you know, collect a lot of data and, and you know, have some things happen um, in, 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 a, in a single page app. Even though, but it might look like they're going through several different pages as they're doing it. And then they hit a button to say, you know, submit or whatever. And that's when the call is made to the server. Whereas when you have, you know, uh, your Java application, every single time you change, uh, you know, routes and go to the next thing, it's, it's, you know, making, it's running those controllers every single time. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, so I don't have um uh I don't I do not have a React version of this yet. I really wanted to, but I have not with moving and everything, I have not had the time. So uh at some point I will actually get a React version of this uh connected. Uh, since that's what we're teaching now, um, that might be more useful for you for the exact, you know, kind of exact example of the code. But you can still look at this and play, you know, toy around with it a little bit and you'll get the gist of it. The file structure is a little bit different because the components are stored with groups of files that belong together. So artwork details has all of its stuff. Artwork card has all of its stuff. So this is the component that's just, you know, one single one of these cards. Um, and so that's kind of how I've broken it out. Um, and, you know, I've got, I've got these different classes in here. You'll also notice this is TypeScript, um, which is a um, uh, superset of, uh, I, I mean, I have that quite right, of JavaScript, um, but it, it's very similar. It just means that you declare types like, like you do with Java. Um, so yeah, um, I, you guys are about to head into a whole grand adventure with your capstone projects in um, you know, unit three, and you're gonna be learning a lot of new things um, because uh, in order to put together a full stack application, uh, just doing the extent of what we taught you so far is not going to be enough. There will be some new things you have to learn. And sometimes you're gonna want to learn new things. You're gonna say, hey, we have this, you know, idea for something we want our app, but uh, we haven't learned how to do that yet. And so, you know, one or two of you will go learn it and uh, figure it out. And that's that's part of the process. And that's really good because it, it's going to give you that much more to be able to um, show prospective employers what you're capable of. And also the fact that you are capable of learning more new things on the fly, um, which is a highly, highly desired trait for, uh, you know, new devs, as that you show, you can kind of come in and just pick things up. Um, that said, it's it's gonna be hard. You're gonna have times when you get stuck and when you get frustrated and um, uh, that's okay, because that's also normal. Um, but uh, it's gonna be a good, it, it's gonna be a good experience and you're gonna come out of it with something you'll be proud of, which will be really great. Okay. This is a short lecture, guys. Uh, this is about all, I, all I've got uh, for you. Any last questions? We wanted to thank you, so. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so yeah, all you have left uh, for this unit anyway is um, the catch up class on Monday. Uh, if you need it to wrap a few things up, your TAs will be available but I highly encourage you to hit up their office hours between now and then so that you can get things done and they can get stuff graded and, and marked off for you. Um, and er, not, you know, not everything is too last minute. Uh, okay, so for studio tonight, you are going to consume a uh, coding events API with Postman. So they've created 
a new version of the coding events application that actually has an API um, that can be consumed. That's what you call it when you, uh, you know, reach out to these endpoints and make these requests. Um, so you're going to install Postman. You will fork and clone and then serve that API, uh, API application that they provide for you for this, this uh, coding events API. And then you're going to use Postman to make requests. You're going to perform different CRUD operations on uh, the data in the database through uh, the API, um, kind of like you saw me do with these get requests where I was just reaching out to get information, but you're going to do more than that. Um, so that is, uh, you know, in the curriculum uh, in chapter 20. So uh, you guys can head off and get started with that. And you've got plenty of time. And if you're still working on any of your graded assignments, um, you'll probably have time for that too.